everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to be talking about Unit 16, the Excretory System, our new unit. So I have some materials up here for you on Google Classroom. They're going to include the teacher notes slides, the student notes, and a kind of general overview of what we're going to be doing from lesson to lesson. So we also have here the study guide packet and objectives as well. So as we're moving through the unit, you can start working on either of these. And of course, that's going to be due at the end of the unit on review day. And for today, let's jump right on into it for lesson one. So for lesson one, we're going to start off with some notes, some teacher notes and using videos that are embedded in those slides and also this pre-recorded lesson. And then once you have gathered the information for lesson one, I'm gonna have you do a Google document, a Google Doc homework overview of the lesson for today. So you're gonna take a look at these questions and use your notes to answer them. In addition, we have two other um, documents or PDFs that are attached. Those you can use as more practice for lesson one if you'd like. So again, Google Doc is for homework and these are just for extra practice if you would like to do some. Therefore, let's jump right on in the excretory system. Let's first take a look at the essential idea as we move into lesson one. So our essential idea is going to be that all animals excrete nitrogenous waste products and some animals also balance water and solute concentrations. So today we're going to be taking a look at how osmolarity plays a role and also that animals or different animals are going to excrete different kinds of nitrogenous waste products. So the form in which nitrogenous waste is excreted reflects evolution and the ecological niche occupied by that animal. And we're going to take a look at specifics as we go through the slides for lesson one. So here we have a kind of nice video on the excretory system in general. So as we're moving through the unit, you can use this video to help you out as we move from lesson to lesson. So to get started with lesson one, we're going to be taking a look at the different types of excretion. I'm going to ask you to first pause this video and come here to watch this four minute video just to give you some background in what exactly osmolarity is and different vocab words that we're going to be talking about into this lesson one. So take a pause in this video, take a look at that one, and then come back here. So hopefully you've taken a look at this video and now kind of have a background of what some vocab we're going to be taking a look at is. So just two most important ones right now that you can write right in your um, student notes packet in the table that says osmolarity and osmoregulation. So osmoregulation is the maintenance of constant osmotic pressure in the fluids of an organism by the control of water and salt concentrations. So you can think, okay, we're going to be regulating osmolarity. You can kind of dissect the word to see what it means. And osmolarity is going to be the concentration of a solution expressed as the total number of solute particles. And again, we've talked about this before in previous units, but osmolarity, you can also think of it as the diffusion of water. So before we get into specifics, I first want to take a look at the definition of excretion. And there's no specific spot for you to write this in your notes, but if you can just find a spot maybe on the top to write in this short definition. So excretion is the removal from the body of waste products of metabolism. So we don't consider defecation as excretion as feces is not the waste product of metabolism, but instead is undigested food. So we're going to be talking more about nitrogenous waste and how the body of different organisms produces different kinds of this nitrogenous waste. But first, we're going to talk about osmolarity and how there's different kinds of animals and different kinds of osmolarity that they're going to be using. Specifically, we're going to take a look at osmoconformers and osmoregulators. So first, we'll take a look at osmoconformers and what they exactly are. So for this, you're going to be using the table that's in your student notes packet and using this slide to answer that table based off of how, um, based off of the topics in there. So osmoconformers maintain an internal condition that are equal to the osmolarity of their environment. So you can think they're going to be conforming to the environment that they're in or conforming to the osmolarity of the environment that they are in. So this is going to minimize the osmotic gradient, and it's going to minimize the water movement in and out of the cells. But a disadvantage here is that internal conditions may be suboptimal. So they're going to change based off the environment that it's in. However, they're not going to be using a lot of energy. It's a very um, 
easy thing to do, but there are disadvantages that come with it. And most osmoconformers are going to be marine invertebrates. So an example would be a starfish. So in contrast, we have osmoregulators as well. And for this one, you can think, okay, they're going to be regulating their osmolarity. So osmoregulators are going to tightly regulate their body osmolarity, which always stays constant irrespective of the environment. So again, even if the environment osmolarity changes, the osmolarity within the organism is going to stay the same. And for this one, kidneys are going to play a large role here. And it's going to play a large role by regulating the amount of water reabsorbed. But a disadvantage here is that Osmoregulation costs animals ATP. Here we're going to be using a lot of energy. And osmoregulators are much more common in the animal kingdom. So an example would be bony fish. So here we have two different types of fish. Both of them are going to be osmoregulators. One is from salt water and one is from fresh water. Both of them regulating the osmolarity within their bodies. So let's more specifically see what kind of metabolic wastes are being excreted from the bodies of different organisms that we see on the daily. So we're going to be taking a look at three specific kinds of nitrogenous wastes that can be produced by different organisms. And what I did in my notes is kind of consolidated the paragraphs that are here and matched them up with the different animals and took my notes on the picture that is here that matches this note slide. So we're first going to talk about aquatic animals. So animals such as fish and amphibians, which have constant access to water, are going to flush, flush their nitrogenous waste primarily as ammonia. So if you follow the arrows down, fish, aquatic animals, are, and aquatic invertebrates, are going to be excreting their nitrogenous waste as ammonia. And ammonia, as we're going to find out, is a lot more toxic than, let's say, these other two nitrogenous waste products that we're about to talk about. But again, we have to remember that these animals are in usually environment filled with water, so they don't really have to hold in the nitrogenous waste. They can just let it out, and therefore, they're going to excrete it as ammonia. Now let's take a look at mammals. So mammals are going to metabolize ammonia into a molecule called urea. So as you can see here, following the lines down, mammals are going to be creating urea. And terrestrial animals, however, because they have less access to water, have been under selective pressure to repackage their toxic ammonia as less toxic molecule, because you don't want that toxic molecule just sitting in your body. So terrestrial animals have been able to create it into urea. And since this less toxic molecule um, can be flushed with less water, it's more helpful to excrete it in that form. And then our next type of nitrogenous waste is going to come in the form of what birds and reptiles excrete. So reptiles and birds go one step further. They're going to package their nitrogenous waste as uric acid, and it requires more metabolic energy to make than urea, but it's less toxic and requires very little water to flush from the body, which is an advantage there. So you can think of uric acid as the white paste that you might see on your cars if you're parked under a tree and there's a bunch of birds in the tree, you'd be seeing uric acid on your car, let's say. That's the waste product that is going to be excreted by a lot of birds. So using that information, I'm going to ask you to fill out the advantages and disadvantages of all three using what we just discussed here and maybe a little research of your own. So that's going to be done individually based off of what we just discussed. So we talked a little bit about um, reptiles and birds, but we also have insects in here too. So we're now going to take a look at how insects specifically excrete their nitrogenous waste. So I'm going to ask you to flip your page of your notes or go to the next page and take a look at this fine insect here, this grasshopper. We're going to dive into the inside of the grasshopper to see what exactly it's doing to get rid of its nitrogenous waste. So within a grasshopper, within insects in general, they're going to have a midgut, and within that midgut, we have the malpighian tubules, and then they have a hindgut as well. So we're going to discuss how this all plays a role in their excretory system. So we're going to go step by step. So here we have the stomach or the gut of the uh, insect, and these bluish um, little lines here, tubules here, are going to be, be the malpighian tubules that are attached to this system. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing in your notes packet, just kind of annotate 
this diagram here, along with the arrows that are pointing to the specific parts of this system. So let's start off from number one. So salts and uric acid are actively transported into the Malpighian tubules. So you can sit, think that they're coming into these blue tubes here. And this makes the tubules hypertonic relative to the um, hemolymph. And remember, hypertonic, we've already gone over that. Okay, you can think of that definition that we've talked about in previous units. And as a result, water will flow into the tubule via osmosis. So you can see here that our arrows are now pointing into the stomach section or the intestine section of this insect's gut. So now let's take a look at number two. So the Malpighian tubule drains into the lumen of the digestive tract. So we can see here it comes right on into the center pink. For three, in the hindgut, salts and water are going to be absorbed back into the hemolymph. And the hemolymph, you can think of just as like an insect's form of blood. Okay, so you can think that these salts and waters are now going to be absorbed back into there or the insect's type of blood. Okay, and last but not least, dehydrated wastes, including this now ur uric acid, are going to be released from the anus at the end of the gut. So you can think that we're coming in through the Malpighian tubules, it's doing what it has to do, and then that uric acid is being excreted from the insect. So this kind of just dives into more of a specific system that an insect, different organism, uses. So as we move on, we're going to talk more about the kidneys, so how mammals um, use the organs in their body to excrete this nitrogenous waste. But for now, we just took a look at all of the different types of waste that could be produced by different organisms. So now that we've gone through that, I'm gonna ask you to come back to the Google Classroom and go into the Google document. And you're just gonna go through and using our notes, fill out these tables, fill out the questions as you move through. There are also a couple of links in here that you're going to need to use to answer the questions. There's one down here as well. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Feel free to join a Google Hangout. Anything you need, I am here. 